The years since Saddam have been full of pain and uncertainty. Both the coalition and Iraqi leaders have paid for their numerous mistakes with thousands of lives and billions of dollars. It's too early to say that Iraq is back on its way to becoming one of the leaders of the Arab world, but the trends at last may now offer some hope. Well, I spoke earlier to Adam Brooks, our correspondent in Baghdad. I asked him whether it's at all possible to generalize about how, how Iraqis see this fifth anniversary. Well, Jeremy, it's a, it's a mosaic of thought and feeling and experience, as you'd expect, really. I spoke to uh, a doctor uh, yesterday who, last week, in one of the safest districts of Baghdad, uh, had a, a bomb go off outside, right outside his surgery, that killed more than 40 people. And when I said, you know, how do you feel five years? And he said, how do you expect I feel five years in? Uh, I spoke to a history professor who told me uh, there's no underlying change here. And when I hear the Americans talk about Iraq, it sounds to me like they're talking about life on Mars. But then I spoke to a family who I've known for a couple of years here. And, and the mother of the family said, it's the little things that are getting a little better. She said, we go out for a walk in the evenings now along the, the river. We send our kids, allow our kids to walk to school and back by themselves, and we know they'll, they'll come back. Uh, they, they, they're beginning to feel a little more relaxed about the little things in life. What's markedly absent is a sense that there is an Iraqi government in place that generates a sense of, of loyalty or optimism. That really is not there. Is there any sense you get of how long they think it's going to be necessary to keep foreign troops there? Well, you know, the BBC did this poll early this week and there was a quite a striking finding which said that about 60%, over 60% of Iraqis wanted US troops to leave, but perhaps not yet. Uh, they wanted them to stay until there was a greater measure of security and a greater measure of political progress. So, you know, the overwhelming majority of Iraqis want foreign forces gone, but they want them gone under the right conditions. I think that's fair to say. Adam, thank you very much. Well, five years ago tonight, Jonathan Powell was one of the few who knew exactly when the bombs were about to start falling. Tony Blair's chief of staff has written a memoir, Great Hatred, Little Room, about Blair's greatest triumph. It's not the Iraq war, but the Northern Ireland peace. I'll be asking him about that in a minute. But first, what were you doing this time five years ago? I guess we were in Downing Street and waiting for what would happen. And at that point, you were fairly confident it would be over pretty quickly. We were fairly confident the military campaign would be over relatively quickly, yes. Do you accept any share of the blame or do you feel any sense of shame or guilt that it's gone on as long as it has? Um, I certainly share the responsibility for the decisions we took on Iraq, yes. Any shame or guilt? No, I don't think I feel shame or guilt. I think it was right to get rid of Saddam Hussein. But of course we were told that that wasn't the primary motivation. The primary motivation was to find weapons of mass destruction which didn't exist. Yes, I made a, a speech about this last year in which I said, actually, I thought that it was been better if we'd been clear that the aim should be to get rid of Saddam, just as in Kosovo we've been trying to kick out Milosevic from Kosovo. But we know from the evidence that was disclosed at the Hutton inquiry that you advise both John Scarlett and Alistair Graham uh, and David Manning uh, on the presentation of evidence on the question of weapons of mass destruction and your concern was how it would appear on the front page of the Evening Standard. Yes, that was a rather flip phrase, but it was a phrase to talk about how it would appear and how it would be seen, yes. And you were concerned to make that threat seem as clear and present as possible? Well, actually, if you look at the other emails that were released of that, I was actually trying to distinguish between intent and capability, if you remember. But your anxiety was that people wouldn't appreciate what a grave danger was posed to Saddam Hussein by these non-existent weapons of mass destruction. Well, we didn't know at that stage that they were non-existent. But yes, it was about how that should be presented and how it should appear. And it was a mistake, you think, in retrospect, to concentrate upon that rather than upon the argument that George Bush tended to focus upon, which was the regime change argument. I think, in retrospect, and with the benefit of hindsight, we should have made more of the threat that Saddam was to his own people. And you still think it was a worthwhile war to fight? Yes, I do. I think it was right to get rid of Saddam. Despite the fact there have been all those deaths since? I don't think anyone in their right mind can be happy to see the death and suffering that's happened in Iraq. I'm glad to see, as your report suggested, that things have got better in Iraq recently, and I think that's a good thing. Just for this years after the event. Well, if you think of the Balkan example, it's 30 years since Tito died. 
And we tried not intervening in the case of Bosnia, and a million people died. We tried intervening in the case of Kosovo, and we had some success. But even now, Balkans has not been resolved. In Kosovo, we still see violence all this time later. When you and Tony Blair sat there in Downing Street, did you ever envisage that the military commitment in Iraq would go on for five years? I think maybe the military commitment, but we didn't envisage the sort of violence there's been, no. So you misjudged that quite seriously? Yes, I think we, made, we were not clear that it would unravel in the way that it has. What was the key uh, mistake you made? I think the, the biggest mistake actually was a conceptual mistake, uh, again with the benefit of hindsight. As I say, I see the comparison as the Balkans. I think we should have seen what a big problem this was going to be. At any stage, removing Saddam was going to lead to a lot of suffering and a lot of bloodshed in Iraq. Saddam was not going to stay forever. He had to be removed at some stage. The question I think is interesting is the one of timing. Did it have to be done then? Could there have been a, a bigger coalition of international support built for the struggle against Saddam? And we know that even at the last minute, just before the war began, George Bush offered Tony Blair the possibility of not committing British troops, and he discounted that. He said he wanted to send British troops. Yes, he said that he wanted the British troops to be there alongside the American troops. Why did he say that? Because he thought it was right to show solidarity with our ally. But it's cost 176 British service people's lives. Indeed, the wars are very dangerous for soldiers, and that's what happens. But he thought, and I would agree with him, that it was correct to stand alongside the Americans, not to leave them alone. You don't resile from the decision at all? No, I take full responsibility for it, and I think it's the right thing to do. But it's ironic, isn't it, that when people look back on Tony Blair's time in Downing Street, they will see this as probably the biggest part of his legacy, an illegal war, in quotes, as opposed to peace in Northern Ireland. I'm not sure they will. I think when they look back at him uh, in further times, when people come to write histories, there'll be a more balanced assessment of Tony Blair. It won't be just the Iraq war. And things in Iraq, too, will look different at that stage. So I think it's rather hard to guess now how things will seem in 10, 20, and 30 years' time. When you look at Northern Ireland, which is what your book is about, you were intimately involved in that peace process. You cite this example of it's like having a bicycle. You've got to keep it moving. Uh -huh. um, that does imply that has all sorts of implications for Iraq, doesn't it? The implications for Iraq? That you have to keep talking to people in order to, order to keep some sort of semblance of peaceful activity. Absolutely. Activity I was struck peaceful. by the comments of, of one of the people in Mark Urban's package who was talking about the need to uh, move faster on national reconciliation. I think that's absolutely right. The need to bring the Sunni and the Shia and the dissident leaders and talk to them. When you look back on it, of course there were key figures involved of, which Tony Blair was, of whom Tony Blair was one. But there were big changes, there must have been big changes that had happened in Ireland in order to make that peace come about. Whether it was the revolutionaries getting middle-aged or something happening within the European Union or prosperity in the South, what was it? You're absolutely right. It was a combination of the personalities involved and the big changes that had happened. In the South it was the rise of the Celtic Tiber, Tiger, the disappearance of the priest-ridden, um, poverty-stricken Ireland that the Unionists used as a bugbear. That had gone. On the other side, Gerry Adams and Martin McGuinness reached an age where they were no longer a fighting age. They were worried about the next generation getting mixed up in terrorism, mixed up in violence, and they could see the need to reach peace. On the other side, the British security forces knew too that they could not win by military means. So on the, all sides there were these fundamental changes. And then you were so lucky to have people who could actually bring this about, the local political leaders like Gerry Adams and Martin McGuinness and Ian Paisley and David Trimble and Bertie Ahern and Tony Blair. If you hadn't had that combination of the right people and the big changes, it would be very hard indeed to bring peace. The war's finished for good there. I've been making a TV program for, for BBC Two about this, and every single person I asked, from the Orangeman and Drum Cree to the Catholic priests in, in West Belfast, said to me, this was over, and there was no way it could go back. And I found that very encouraging. Jonathan Powell, thank you. Well, it was five years ago today that almost 300,000 coalition troops were massed on the Iraqi border, waiting for the order to invade. Tonight's 10 days to war focused on one group in the 1st Battalion, the Royal Irish Regiment. Their commanding officer was Colonel Tim Collins, played in the drama by Kenneth Branagh. It remains my foremost intention to bring every single one of you out alive. But there may be those among us who will not see the end of this campaign. And we will... We will put them in their sleeping bags and we will send them back. And there will be no time for sorrow. We will grieve for them later. The enemy should be in no doubt that we are his nemesis and we are bringing about his rightful destruction. 
But remember, it is a big step to take another human life. It is not to be done lightly. I know of men who have taken life needlessly in other conflicts. I can assure you, they live with the mark of Cain upon them. And I know your Mars will be in the queue at the co-op next week, and they won't want you to let them down. Let's bring everybody home safely and leave Iraq a better place for us having been there.